Hi, I'm Elizabeth, this is The Bookish North, and today I want to talk about some more non-fiction books while it is still November. So this has been a weird year, let's leave it there. Uh, but the fact is, I have read a lot of books this year that I haven't talked about on this channel, and by now I've sort of given up on the idea that I will somehow manage to catch up with them all. But what I want to do today is to talk about some of my favourite non-fiction reads that I haven't mentioned on this channel this year. So I'm going to start with my very favourite of the year and it is this one called Square Haunting by Francisca Wade. I read this back in May and I read it as a buddy read with Sarah from Hardcover Hearts and we had such a great time reading this book. So this is a joint biography of five women and I have to admit, though reluctantly, that prior to reading this book I had only really heard about one of them, which was Virginia Woolf. Uh, the other five are uh, Hilda Doolittle, Dorothy L. Sayers, Jane Ellen Harrison and Eileen Powers. And they were all women who were somehow sort of pioneers within their field of work and they were all women for which work was a very important part of their life. Uh, so the premise of this book is that it takes these five women who had one other thing in common, and that is that they all lived within the same square in London within roughly the same period of time. They didn't live there simultaneously, so it wasn't like they were in and out of each other's apartments, although some of them did meet and knew each other, but the, the th they lived in that same area in, in London uh, and that's the red thread that binds these stories together. And what I particularly loved about this book is just how well she managed to connect these stories to each other and to the place. I got this immense sense of both time and place while reading this book. She did a very good job of bringing it alive on the page and just by by the small things so knowing what the weather was like on a certain date uh, and all of these little snippets and I trusted that these were not just there for you know it wasn't fictionalized uh, because it was clear that all of these snippets telling of those giving you those little telling details were all parts of letters or diary entries from the people in question or some of the people around them. Uh, and that just gave it that real sense of, of um, attachment to place and location and I love that. And I think this is a book that uh, takes off a lot of my boxes. It's, it is a feminist book, it's about London uh, and it's about women who are very much about their work and I love reading stories like that and yeah I, I don't know what else to say about it I absolutely loved it I thought it was brilliantly written uh, and I mean I think this was Francesca Wade's debut as a book uh, and she with this she made the list of authors that I will just auto buy their books and then it's also this beautiful you know, item. I, I love the cover uh, of this book as well. Um, it was one of those books where I saw it on Instagram first. I instantly knew that this was going to be a book for me and I'm so glad I was right. Uh, and I, yeah, I, it's, uh, it was, it's probably my favourite book of the year, uh, just overall so far. Uh, there's still a month to go, so we'll see. Uh, I just wanted to mention two other books who are sort of along the same line in that they are telling a joint story of various different women. One of them I listened to as an audiobook and it was uh, Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Sh Shetley. Uh, I didn't read my own handwriting there. Uh, but yeah, it's the story about African-American women who worked as uh, human computers uh, in the NASA space race. Uh, so they were brilliant mathematicians who helped uh, get humans into space. And it's a fascinating story. It's a story I didn't really knew existed before 
well, before I heard about the movie Hidden Figures, to be fair. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, but now I've read the book that was behind it, and I found it fascinating. And it also reminded me a lot of, uh, you know, Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Kowal, which is a sci-fi story, but who, which is about uh, other women like that. Um, so, I mean, those two knit well together, I would say. Uh, but it was super fascinating hearing the stories about these women. I did give it three stars, I s just saw when I went through it now. And I think that was because I did feel like the writing was slightly clunky at times. And I think because I listened to it as an audiobook, I was slightly more confused uh, about who was who than I would have been if I read it in physical form, because I feel like names are harder for me to stick when I hear them than when I read them for some reason. And also because some of the stories of these women were, or at least the sort of origin story of how they came to be there, were kind of similar because of course they had this big thing in common and that they were really talented with numbers, they were really good mathematicians. So a lot of their stories sort of lined up in how they excelled in school in these subjects. Uh, so it's natural that their stories are similar in that way. Uh, but that combined with the fact that I was listening to it made, made it sometimes hard to tell them apart. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it's a brilliant work of getting uh, a story out there that wasn't really all that known. Uh, I had no idea before hearing about this that it even was a profession to be a computer, that that was a human profession, not just, you know, a machine. So it was very educational and uh, I thought it was uh, well worth the time reading it. And then the third book among, along the same lines is The Five by Halle Rubenholt. Uh, that was, I think, all over booktube last year, and I can see why, because this was also brilliant. This tells the story about the five women that were the victims of Jack the Ripper, but this doesn't really focus on their murders or about Jack the Ripper at all. It all focuses on these five women, and I'm just amazed at how much is known about them, how much you can recreate their stories, uh, because these were not, you know, famous women. They were made famous by the way they died, but they lived perfectly ordinary lives up until then, and that you can recreate and tell the stories of women that have lived a life that would maybe resemble my own if I was uh, born at that time. I don't know, but it, it was fascinating uh, to get to know these women that were not, you know, not pioneers in a field or not exceptional in that way. They were not great mathematicians or writers or scholars or queens or whatever. They were ordinary people living ordinary lives and I learned so much from that time period of reading this book and uh, it's highly recommended. So those were the first three books that had sort of that common biography thing going on. Uh, then I have three more books I just wanted to show you. Uh, I needed to have a language book in here, of course, uh, and I have here Language Visible Unraveling the Mysteries of the Alphabet from A to Z by David Sachs. So this is a story about the alphabet. Uh, it's a story about the alphabet as used in the English language as of today. Uh, so we get one chapter for each of the letters in the alphabet telling the origin story and the various uh, ways that letter has looked and sounded up through various alphabets before it ended up where it is today, sort of. Uh, and I, I, I like reading books about alphabets. I have read several. Uh, this is by far the most comprehensive about the letters of the English language today that I have read. Uh, I did find a lot of interesting information in this, uh, but I was a bit conflicted when reading this because I also was very much annoyed at a couple of things. Um, so it wasn't all 
it wasn't all great, I would say. Uh, the two things that really annoyed me was, one of it was just the typesetting and how it kept being broken up by, by long uh, sort of fact boxes or just so I, I had to just go back and forth, back and forth all the time. Uh, I didn't feel like it needed to be placed where it was. I felt like I could have finished the one ID and then had that as just a next paragraph instead of having these boxes inserted, making me ch have to choose between going into something completely new while I was still mid sentence or then, or to go on and finish the thought I was sort of reading and then go back a few pages to that box with a different kind of information. So that was one thing I found tiring. And then the other thing, I understand why it's there because this is a book that is written so that you can actually just read one chapter uh, and leave it there. That you, If you want to know just the story of the letter A, you can read that and it will make complete sense in its own right. Uh, but when, like me, you read the book from cover to cover, that got insanely repetitive in a bit because a lot of the letters share the same story. Uh, they have sort of taken the same journey through the same kind of alphabets and so reading them all one after another just got very repetitive and that also got quite annoying. But you know, overall, it's still a book I would recommend if you are interested in learning the history of the letters of the alphabet. Maybe, maybe space it out just a little and not read all in one go and then it would probably be less annoying <laughs> than it was for me. Um, then I wanted to quickly mention a Norwegian book that I guess most of you watching this won't be able to read, but I still wanted to mention it. And it's called Rasismens Poetik, or The Poetics of Racism, by Guro Sibeko. So this is an anti-racist book, and it made a big impact on me, because she made me see things that I hadn't necessarily thought about in that way before. And what I most appreciated with this book is that it combines poetry and essays. Uh, Guru Sibeko is a known slam poet here in Norway, so she combines her poetry with um, very level-headed and informative essays about anti-racism. Uh, and the combination of these two made for a very powerful whole, because the poems are very angry, and she really gets that through through the poems uh, and then the essays are level-headed and informative as I said um, there it's not that there there's anger in them as well but it's much more subdued and and explained in a different way so it's not that raw emotional anger um, it's more that you know <laughs> justifiable uh, I, I don't know how to explain it, but the combination of the two really made this a powerful read for me. I had it out from the library when everything shut down in March and I had it at home for like two months because uh, the libraries were closed so I couldn't turn it back. So I've read it and I really appreciate it and now I've bought my own copy because this is a book I really need to have to be able to go back to. Uh, it, in addition to you know explaining a lot of things, she also gives you a lot of pointers to other things you should read to educate yourself. Uh, so this was a great, uh, great book and definitely one to recommend if you read Norwegian books. Uh, I feel like it's important in educating myself to read stuff not just from you know the US or the UK but also from my own country talking about uh, things closer to home and that was definitely a book that did that. And then the last book I want to mention is uh, uh, you know one of the one author that I discovered, uh, I think during Nonfiction November last year, I read my first book by her and she quickly became a favorite of mine, and it's Vivian Gornick. Uh, this is called Unfinished Business, Notes of a Chronic Rereader. And, you know, that title pretty much gives it away. These are different essays about rereading uh, and about, well, the joy of rereading, why she rereads and how she's 
sees different things in the books the different times she has read them. So she talks about specific books that she has reread and then about what she has seen in them on second and third readings that she didn't see the first time and why she enjoys rereading and how, uh, how you can see a book different because your experience is different and how you can um, relate to different characters in the book. Maybe as a young person you will identify with the younger people in the book and you will feel that the parent generations are way off and then you read it again when you are a parent yourself and you will see it from their point of view in a whole different way. Uh, and I found this very fascinating and this is also one of those books that I know I will come back to and reread because uh, with a lot of the books she was talking about I hadn't read them myself and I feel like I would have get, gotten even more out of this book if I had read those other books. So I feel like I want to read some of those and then I want to go back and read her thoughts on them. So I feel like this is one that's going to sit on my shelf for a very long time and that I'm going to pick out again and again which I feel like is, is a good way of having written a book about rereading uh, in a way that I definitely want to be rereading this specific book. So those were the books I wanted to mention today. I think those are my favourite non-fiction books that I haven't talked about on this channel this year. I have also other books that I have talked about in other videos. They are excluded from this one. So I'm guessing there will be a sort of a favourites of the year video towards the end of December or the beginning of January, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, these are all books I would recommend. Now it's late in nonfiction November this year, but there's always next year. And you know what? I'll let you in on a secret. You can read nonfiction all year round. So I guess um, that was all from me today. And uh, I hope uh, I'll be seeing you soon. Bye.